Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to start first by thanking the GI for making today possible, and also thanking our panelists who've joined us today, Katerina Ziatopoulou, Casey uh, Kareja, Brett Lingwa, Lalita Oka, and Bill Kitch. I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow organizers, Marika Santagata, Matt Evans, Michelle Berry, and I'd like to thank you all for who filled out the survey. Uh, your responses and feedback to the survey helped us shape the panel today. So to begin, I'd like to ask Marika to give an overview of our survey results to share with you all. Okay, let me just, uh, good afternoon. Let me just take, share my screen. Here we are. My apologies. Okay. Thanks everybody and a good afternoon. Um, I wanna just say a few words about the, what we learned from the survey that several of you kindly uh, completed and uh, as it shaped really our way that we thought about the panel. By the way, if you have not done so, we'd love for you to still complete the survey in the next couple of days, and we hope to pre present sort of a more complete view of the geotech experience perhaps at the next Geo Congress. We had 37 responses to the survey with feedback on a wide range of courses. Uh, this graph that you see here shows the types of courses for which you provided information. Over half of them fell in a category that we term courses on fundamentals. And actually the vast majority of these courses were courses where the undergraduate introductory geotech course that many of us, including myself, taught last semester. And um, a large fraction of these courses have a very significant laboratory component. And indeed for many of us, uh, there was a, we, ha we were tasked with the challenge of translating the laboratory experience online. And this is one topic our panel will be touching on in a few minutes. Most of us started from ground zero with really no to limited uh, background in, uh, and availability of online content. This was true, not for everybody. And today you will be hearing from a couple of colleagues that essentially fell in this bottom category uh, who are much more experienced uh, in this area. We all had to adapt and to different degrees and implement changes uh, in different areas. This slide uh, summarizes your answers to the question, to what extent did you alter the following components? They're shown here uh, of your course. Blue stands for significant change, orange marginal, and gray for no change. Um, the vast majority of those who completed the survey felt that they were able, and this was also evident from the comments provided, to deliver a course that did not deviate significantly in terms of content and scope and in terms of learning outcomes from that which had originally been planned. In other areas, such as student assessments, in particular through exams and quizzes, as you see here at the bottom, and in laboratories, um, much more significant changes had to be um, implemented. We all seem to agree that it wasn't easy. And um, the, answer to our, the answers to our question, what was the greatest pain point, fell rather evenly in four categories. The first one was time. Uh, who knew how time consuming it was gonna be to prepare a good online lesson? The second was technology, both at our end, um, as we had to quickly learn to manage and use uh, some new tools, but also then at the students end with issues related to connectivity and uh, access to software, for examples. Preparing and administering exams and concerns over the fairness and uh, concerns over academic honesty ended up being an issue for many of us. And two of our panelists today will share their experience in this particular area. And finally, many of those who responded indicated that the major pain point was maintaining student engagement and motivation, as well as more broad concerns over students' uh, well-being and our panelists will specifically touch on these points. As you can see from this graph, 
synchronous interaction was a preferred choice for the vast majority of us, uh, either um, who either use this approach alone or in combination, the orange part, with this asynchronous uh, teaching. And turns out we, we got it right. Um, it, it, it mattered. Um, one of you, um, one of the responders said it best, students craved the regular interaction afforded by synchronous lecture, and so did many of the faculty. I, I know I did. And um, indeed, in answering our question, which was what based on student feedback was most successful, uh, the majority of, of the responders pointed some, to something related to live interaction, personal connection, synchronous, and, and so on. Other aspects valued by the students were clarity in planning and communication, as well as the opportunity and the ability to review pre-recorded content and learn at their own pace. And this is something probably worth keeping in mind as we hopefully soon uh, transition back to in-person teaching. We will learn a lot more about students' perspectives from our last panel today, my Purdue colleague, Kerry, um, in just a few minutes. And um, this is all I have for now. I'm going to pass it back to Brina. Thank you. Thank you, Marika. So our first panelist today is uh, Katarina Ziotopoulou. And based off of the feedback that we got from the survey, we picked a number of themes and asked our panelists to discuss on each of those themes. Katarina today will be speaking about student engagement. Let me... Please share my screen. Okay. Okay, so um, hello from California. I'm going to put my presentation in full screen and I will be touching on student engagement in an online environment today, specifically for the quarter system. Um, we started our quarter system on the 30th of March, which was about 15 days after the lockdown was announced. So that posed particular challenges for some of our classes. Um, I want to start with um, sharing a few um, reiterating thoughts that have been coming up. Um, and basically, teaching online or remotely during a pandemic when you have no other chance choice, um, it's hard and it's too much to work. And at least from my perspective, it will feel a little less if treated for the brain. I have to acknowledge that, at least for me, designing an online course was a nonlinear process in which deciding the prepared structure is a function of the student body, the learning objectives you want to meet, your personality, and the tools that will have um, At the end of the day, there has to be a compromise between quality and quantity, and in my case, I, I reduced some of the content to ensure quality. In terms of student engagement, for the course, for the system in particular, it was important to uh, get the order started, but also in order to maintain the morale and the drive and the excitement of myself, the TAs, and the students, um, maintain communication, be able to catch issues as they arise, but also maintain performance and engage in active learning activities and uh, maintaining assessment so that we make sure that nobody falls behind. Before the quarter, we first of all um, had, um, luckily, a UC Davis wide survey on student demographics for each one of our classes. I did an open Zoom door uh, time for for seat, just so that the students could drop by, see my face, ask questions, and that worked quite well. Um, and I also circulated my own very informal, just calibration survey before deciding anything. Um, so my questions were basically targeting at just knowing what the students um, had available to them for UC Davis in particular. And the outcome that came from that, and I was mostly concerned about equipment and internet, was that the students, if they knew what I would need from them, they would make sure to find it, in particular internet. The other thing that we did um, with the help of my TAs was that we made a movie trailer for um, the class. We were concerned that the students would not know who we are, it was an unknown, so making this helped the students just put some faces on the names and just um, really get excited. And um, I got feedback from that, and the students um, really got really pumped up for, for the upcoming quarter. Now, 
During the quarter, um, one fact I would like to share is that there's about one million methodologies out there about what to do for engagement. And um, for me, ultimately, it, what, what worked was just pick a few things that I wanted to do and stick with those because structure is important as some of the other panelists will touch on today. So what I did for my solar mechanics class um, during this spring quarter, um, I put one topic each week and it, that consisted of one asynchronous lecture and one synchronous lecture Tuesday and Thursday. Um, the asynchronous lectures serve to cover theory and provide reflection time, but also provide flexibility for the students and myself while the synchronous lectures provided opportunities to practice and interact and basically be human. Now the challenge that comes from that is the connection between the two because the Thursday lecture is critically hinging on the Tuesday part. So I had to make sure that students would interact in a way um, in that environment. So for the asynchronous lectures for Tuesdays, it was a combination of screen recording of more, not more than 15 minutes each time that I would upload via Kaltura to the UC Davis video um, host, and I would put play posit bulbs on top of that. Play posit is an add-on application that allows you to add the so-called interactions to your videos. Those interactions would be one announcing interaction basically at the beginning with the learning objectives of each lecture. I had some spread out in between with very low hanging um, fruits basically for the students, just true false, nothing too much. Just did you basically hear what I just said? Um, those um, would assign some grades so that they would feel motivated to do. Um, I also asked one question at the end. So do you have any questions that you still um, haven't answered? And then I would collect all these questions and at the beginning of the Thursday lecture, I would answer them all back. And this worked very well because the students are used to taking online quizzes and just um, being interactive and they would see them over 20 minute increments um, and just enjoy that aspect. Now for the Thursday lectures and the synchronous part, um, there were a few things that I did. One of them was getting out occasional Zoom polling just to check. You know, it's always, sometimes I was talking into a blank screen and that feels uncomfortable. Um, so that helped just knowing that there's somebody out there. Um, I also established um, a chat protocol for communications. So I asked in the students in the chat to write an H if they had wanted to raise a hand when I asked the question, write a Q when they had a question to ask. It's really hard to interrupt when you have 70 people online and I'm sure we all suffered from that. And if I wanted to talk uninterrupted, I would put some dashes and the students would just um, listen. A um, few comments and observations from that. Um, I don't have concrete numbers, but my impression is that the students did participate more. Um, it was actually more equitable because the, the ones who felt talking, they talked, and the other ones who wanted to write, they wrote, and it was, it, it was great. Um, and the, 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 the caveat of that is that you have to be a little bit more patient with the awkward silences that in the classroom are um, a little easier to go through. Lastly, for, for the Thursday lectures, and one of the things that was the most um, exciting for all of us actually um, given the fact that we couldn't do live labs i completely repurposed my tas and readers and basically what they did they all joined the lecture every thursday they were all very uh, well equipped so thank you to the department for uh, for that um, and each one joined with two instances one with our laptop so that the students could see them and each one with a tablet so what that basically allowed me to do was to break 70 students in seven breakout rooms and then each breakout room would have the exact same structure every week so that the same 10 students would see the same TA or reader every week and that allowed them to build rapport and it was more private. So what happened in those breakout rooms, there was a lot of practicing and think per share activities and I would distribute the same material to all with the solutions so that um, all the TAs could um, inflict consistency across the exercises. Um, all the independent interactions in every room were much more casual, especially in the room with the TAs, admittedly. Um, and I even realized that the students would turn on their videos with the TAs, but never with me, especially um, in that environment. So that was very positive and they were felt more comfortable in asking questions and taking their time and asking. Um, we coordinated this um, via a Slack channel so that um, we would chat with the TAs. How's everyone doing? Are you doing this exercise? Oh, I'm there. Oh, I'm wrapping up in two minutes. Oh, great. You know, things like that. 
And then ultimately, and based on the reviews that we got back, this was the favorite part of the course, the fact that they still maintained um, great interactions in, in these breakout rooms. So with that, I will wrap up and needless to say, I'm happy to chat and brainstorm with anyone on options and ideas. Thank you, Katerina, for that. I forgot to mention before I introduce the next panelist that we do have a question and answer session after all of the panelists' short presentations. So if you have any questions for any individual panelists or the panelists at large, please feel free to submit them um, on the YouTube um, webpage. Our next panelist is Stacy Kolesia, and she has had more experience with online learning prior to the pandemic. She too is going to talk about student engagement in an online environment. Thank you. So as mentioned, I have been um, teaching online for about seven years. So all of our grad classes at K-State are online. And whenever I talk about this, I always tell my colleagues, get ready because it's coming. And then it came. Um, and what I found is the most useful for student engagement, especially at the undergraduate level, is just effective use of your learning management system. So for my graduate classes, I learned really early on, students need to use their learning management system to submit homework, to watch videos, um, to interact with each other. And I actually started incorporating that into my undergraduate soil mechanics class about five years ago. Um, and so this was a fairly easy transition for me because I had almost everything already set up in my learning management system. And my whole pitch here to you, I guess, is to say your future, your future self will thank you so much if you'll do this. Future Stacy loves me for doing this every year. So just to give you a little bit of what our homepage looks like, on the right here is just a screenshot of two of my weeks. Um, it's just a table that I have built in. Our learning management system is Canvas. I put our learning objectives for each lecture here. And then the students have this um, column that I call notes, and it's really their hub for where they can find all of their information. So where we're going in lab, what chapter to bring, um, what their homework assignment is, and everything can always be submitted online. I don't allow late work, and so most students actually choose to upload their homework online so they know it's, it's uh, there before class starts. So last semester, my class was twice a week, um, Tuesdays, Thursdays, we had lab on Thursday. And what I started doing when I, when I started using Canvas more for undergrads is I took one of their homework problems and I also put that online through Canvas. So what we do always is we have class on Tuesday and then after class on Tuesday, um, Canvas will unlock a problem that I've already programmed into it that's based on that lecture. And they have to do it before class on Thursday. So this forces them, A, to start their homework early, but B, to also review the material um, from the previous lecture. And so it helps to keep them engaged with that content. Because again, I found that was useful for my graduate students to have these frequent knowledge checks to make sure they're kept um, maintaining content. And so everything in my online learning system here is is programmed in. The due dates, the content, online submissions, always. So they already knew how to use that. In terms of the lecture, what I found again from my graduate students is to make it almost the exact same as, it would, as what it would be if we were on campus. So I always write on the board. So for this, I just used um, a desktop recorder that's through our learning management system, but you can use whatever you want. And I used OneNote and I just wrote on the screen. So what I would normally have on the, on the board anyway, so I always have learning objectives at the beginning of class. I give them what I call a geo legend, which are handy um, equations that they might need to use. And then I just wrote um, like I normally would in class. And you can see here, it's not written brilliantly, um, but I never had any complaints about not being able to read anything or about um, not being able or not being clear enough and me needing to type it. The most common thing I heard from people when we were talking about what we were doing um, with our classes is almost everyone said they had their camera off because they didn't want people to see into their homes or they didn't want to dress professionally. As you can see here, I'm wearing a long sleeve t-shirt. It didn't matter. Um, if you turn your camera off, that's another way that you lose the engagement with the students. So in my class in person, we do a lot of, you can already see I'm a big hand waver um, for forces and things like that, but also a lot of small demonstrations. And so here I was talking about distortion settlement. So I fished out my Play-Doh that I had sitting next to me. And then even better, it was old Play-Doh, naturally, as it is every year. Um, and I couldn't actually squish it. And so we had a whole side story about that. 
So when you make these videos to make them more engaging, I find that the more live it is, the better it is. Um, if you try to make it perfect, it's a little less fun. If it was a demonstration that's like a professional video demonstration that I've built, not something waving my hands, I just recorded it ahead of time in my kitchen. Um, and that way I took the video from my phone, I dragged it across my screen, and I just played it as I was talking through this demonstration of consolidation next to my graphic that I drew as I would in class. As a little teaser for uh, undergrads, I tell them if they want, they can follow me on Twitter. It's primarily to show them what my graduate students are doing so that they can get excited about geotech. But in this case, they got to see what was coming up in class this week. And for some reason, apparently 1.6 thousand people watched this little tweet of me making a consolidation demo. What does that online problem look like? We, here's one example. So this is all for consolidation. So from the Tuesday class, they just needed to remember, have a quick refresher on effective stress. Um, and so the problem, I make these little videos and I made these years ago. Um, it's a minute and 43 seconds. Again, not super fancy. I just wrote on my screen. And then I took the problem and I broke it down into a bunch of steps. This is a graded homework assignment. And so when they type in their answer to each one of these steps, it's gonna go through and check it after they submit it. And if they don't get it right, it'll um, give them zero points. And I've plugged a hint in there for them as well. And then they get a second attempt at it. So for example, if they missed question one out of 25 points, if they got it right the second time, they would get a 22.5. So it's a self-graded homework assessment. And also it's giving them that quick informative uh, feedback that students need. So to me, to have a good remote class structure, the best system is to have an effective use of your learning management system to keep your students engaged. So everything that I did, the way it was simpler for me is because I already had this set up. So all homeworks, reminders, those online problems are already in there. The structure that I had set up with the fre frequent knowledge checks with time, we were already doing that, so I didn't have to change anything from my class. And the biggest thing, again, is this is recyclable year to year. So every year I just go and I change the start dates for the semester, and then my class is set up and good to go. Um, I will tell you, when you make these videos, again, you're thinking of your future self, so make sure to put a date on it and, uh, and label it. And so that way, if I know, if I'm going to Geo Congress and I need that second consolidation lecture, I can just go find it. And now I don't need my teaching assistant to teach for me. And students love the videos because they can watch them again and again if they don't quite get it. I do believe imperfect is more engaging and that you can still do demonstrations and work problems like I did in the class. And this is a quote from one of my students that just said it was the easiest transition for them. And I think it's because not really a lot had to change. Pass it on to the next person. Great, thank you. Our next panelist today is Brett Lingwall, and he's going to be discussing um, assessments and especially projects in an online environment. <laughs> I had to unmute myself. So I'm talking about turn projects, and um, like Stacy, I had things set up with a backdrop of, of flipped and ungraded classrooms that made the transition very easy. I'll echo Stacy's recommendation that the use of videos and technology to help your future self, I promise you it helped me as well, it can help you too. So the beauty about term projects is it lets us rethink the entire grading and, and teaching of a class. And my slides aren't transitioning, there we go. So a few years ago I started really thinking about why do I do the things I do in class? Why do I lecture? Why do I give an exam? Why do I do what I do? And started to go back to basics, like very the pure fundamentals of teaching and rework things. Well, and as I did this, there were some philosophical things, which you can read on the screen here, that really helped me come to an approach where I came to the ungraded classroom approach. Now, the ungraded classrooms come out of the liberal arts uh, fields of education, but are very well researched for STEM. And they turn out that they're a wonderful opportunity to help engender very deep learning through these term projects that can be revised continually all semester long. I couple that with flipped classrooms. And why flipped classrooms? Well, it's because when I'm interacting with a student, I want to be more of a guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. And it helps to engage students more throughout the, the, the week. Um, 
interestingly enough, what everybody wants to focus on in a flipped format is the videos. And the videos, I'll echo what Stacey said, imperfect is fine. What we really need to focus on is when we get our students in class interacting with us, that's the stuff that really matters for student buy-in if you're doing a flipped classroom approach where you have a video to watch and then you're interacting. That in-class interactive content is the key to get them engaged. Um, then when we take an ungraded approach with, in terms of revising our projects, revising our homeworks, revising our exams until they reach some level of acceptance, uh, and so that the students can't just get 70% and do you know, three quarters of the work on an exam or on a homework and then walk away, forcing them to revisit all of the content until they've got it, got it to a sound understanding. It helps us move up on Bloom's taxonomy and really does help engage student, students, especially when we have to move these, these hybrid online in-class environments. Um, thing about Bloom's is we're trying to get to the top, to this creation metacognitive level, and there's nothing better in engineering than to have students have to engineer something. Um, if the term projects are well constructed and meaningful, meaning the students can see how it applies to their future career, and it has the aspects of real world complex problems, uh, you can take some of that time you're spending on exams and get rid of it and have the students working on these things that make office hours more meaningful because the students have lots of questions. They've got lots of questions because they're not getting something that's simple, they're getting something that's complex and they're having to take equations and take an equation and make it fit with the real world. They have to iterate and review and interact. Um, some ways to help facilitate this with group term projects, it, uh, one platform is Flipgrid, which is an absolute blast and beats written message boards our students, they live in a video habitat. Their natural habitat is to post videos and reply to videos with other videos. They don't read the letters to the editor in the newspaper. That's not their thing. So Flipgrid provides a wonderful opportunity for them to do what they like to do. Um, the breakout rooms on the Zoom or other web platforms like Katarina talked about. Uh, the thing we need to work on though is this last 20% of students. By my record keeping, about 20% of the students would either interact with me, but not with other students. They would interact with other students or the TAs, but not me. And there's a few who just would not interact. So we, we need to think going forward about some online tools that get everyone engaged consistently. Um, when we're talking about term projects and flipped classrooms, ungraded approaches, incentives are critical. We need to have homeworks that build tools for the term project. For example, if we're doing a foundation design class, the term project is going to be to design a foundation. Well, we can spend one homework building a bearing capacity spreadsheet. Then the next homework, we can revise that bearing capacity spreadsheet to include two layers, a two layer system. And then we can revise that bearing capacity spreadsheet on the next homework. And then at the end of the semester, they're using this spreadsheet for iterative design. Exams that cover background material, quizzes, that focus on the videos to give students that incentive to watch the videos, small group discussions with some sort of small deliverable to keep people reading. On the in-class activities, read what you want to, but down at the bottom, student participation is good. Student led is even better. Student initiated is best. So the more we can have students working on complex things that are having them take theory and apply it in realistic, meaningful ways, we're going to get more student initiated uh, conversations in our in our classes, whether we're physically there or whether we're using some online platform. Uh, the more we move to these open ended problems, we have less cheating and we actually spend less time grading. The reason for that is when students know that they're going to have to revise and iterate their their exam or their term project until it's right they'll do it right the first time, which actually accelerates grading rather than takes more time because you don't have to go through a bunch of incorrect solutions because students are doing them. Um, student athletes and non-traditional students who have other commitments really enjoy the chance to watch videos, especially if they have to miss some for travel or you know babysitting or something. Um, the, the biggest warning though is it's easy to overload students. 
So we need to be cognizant of if we're having them watch videos, read things, participate on homeworks and term projects and everything, the nine hour per week maximum has to be a hard maximum. We can't overload students because it's really easy to get excited about all this stuff and then all of a sudden have students spending 15, 20 hours working on stuff when that doesn't help their learning across their entire career. So with that, I'll turn it back to the panel. Thank you, Brett. Our next panelist is Oka Lalita, and she will be focusing on exams and assessments in an online environment. Hi, um, I'll be sharing my screen. Just a second. <clears throat> So I'll be talking about uh, exams and uh, what my experiences has been during this uh, pandemic. So uh, I have just divided into four or five slides. I'll be going around, uh, going to talk about background, what I did, who my students are, and how did I do about my exams, what methods I used, and what lessons I learned. So first about uh, our school, Fresno State is a... Uh, Hispanic serving institutions. Uh, so we have more than 50% of our students are URM students. Uh, that is underrepresented minority students. So I have to constantly keep that in mind that these students do not have access to laptops, to internet, to and all sorts of things. They are also non-traditional students. They may not have uh, uh, good opportunities at home to work on many of these things that we require to do them for internet, you know, for online uh, uh, instructions. So I was teaching three courses. Uh, my statics class was uh, about uh, 25 students. They were sophomore. Um, my soil engineering or soil mechanics class, they were about junior level. So they had some experiences with engineering classes, particularly in civil engineering. And I had 43 students there. And then uh, last class was the senior design class uh, where I had 29 students who were pretty much they knew uh, what they want to do. So they had different uh, kind of uh, uh, background when they came in into my class. Now, my biggest concern uh, while I adopted some of the uh, online teaching, my all my classes I made it sure that it was synchronous. I did not go asynchronous uh, because I knew our students. I had surveyed them like a quick survey and most of them, they failed that they need to be there in class. Uh, just online learning would not probably work with them. So I decided to stick with synchronous uh, classrooms. And then, but at the same time, I still recorded all my lectures for those who probably uh, they were away, some of the international students had gone home, so they couldn't log in during the time when I was here. And then I had to uh, think about how I am going to deliver all the content. Now, regarding exams, um, I, I always talk to students about my perspective as well as I wanted to know what their perspective is. So my perspective was uh, I am Exam is just one of the assessment tool, and that is not the only tool. So I had to convey that to, to students. Uh, but at the same time, I still need to assess what they have learned. So that was my concern. Then uh, I have to tell them about other assessments so that they don't depend on exams all the time because other assessment, meaning there would be homeworks, there would be quizzes, there would be in-class assignments, there would be group assignments, there are all sorts of things to keep them engaged. So they have to pay attention to how much they are spending time on other assessment as well as they have to think about how much they are putting time on exam. Uh, then how often you do all these things. So uh, I was giving, te technically I was giving two quizzes per week. Uh, sometimes they were in class, sometimes they were uh, online quizzes, but they have to take those quizzes. 
uh, and then exams i had three exams two midterms and one final exam which was comprehensive and then uh, last my concern about exams was to how to avoid cheating or how to at least deter cheating because i knew uh, students like to cheat uh, because they they think that is the only way uh, that they can get the grade uh, of course there are different reasons why they do that but my aim was to just deter students from cheating on exams so uh, we had multiple things that are uh, that are available so first thing we had canvas management system and then learning management system so we had quizzes through canvas so they were doing quizzes homeworks they were uploading on canvas then for uh, statics class uh, i use mastering engineering it comes with their textbook it cost only i think 10 dollars more uh, in addition to their textbook but then it gives them lot of practice it changes just the numbers and you can have settings so that students can take it unlimited times four times five times whatever you think uh, and then they can keep on repeating until they get it right then i also use top hat this itself is a learning management system and now they are going with this after this pandemic from this fall actually they are uh, doing it as a complete learning management system meaning it has a video conferencing tool it has a exams tools uh it has quizzing tool presentation tool everything in one suit uh of course uh i am just uh, i am not using that entire uh suite of what they are offering uh but i i offered actually i was using top hat for 3 uh, 4 years for my soil mechanics class and it works fine uh it essentially it allows you to quiz during lecturing so i could stop my lecturing and then uh, i could ask them quizzes and then they have to answer the quizzes uh, while during the lecture then of course i used responders browser uh, that is i found it this was very effective way to deter students from cheating and that to not it's only i some, some of my colleagues they use lockdown browser only but i also used it along with monitor meaning they have to keep their video camera on so that when they are taking the testing it records them and then there are bunch of different uh, they use artificial intelligence uh, so they kind of detect when the students are out of frame and then uh, the students i mean students can they know that they are being recorded and it is just as a deterrent i was really not interested in catching them are really uh, you know uh, kind of uh, reporting them to the school but just as a deterrent because no one on camera will try to do the cheating because they have to do uh, they have to show me what is there in their room when they take the exam and so many other checks are there so i was using that and then i found that that as an effective way of deterring them from cheating so listen learn so few things uh, i had to actually evaluate options whether to give exam or not to give exam so for my statics class and soil mechanics class i did give them exam full length uh, and then they were all online uh, and of course for my design class i still did give them exam but then the weightage of that exam was reduced uh, then of course i had to take the decision about open book versus closed book all my exams were open book so they could have the book on uh, and then they can uh, take the exam then students i had to take into account whether students have access to laptops desktop or internet most of our students um, they were sharing in their family their laptops but fortunately our school actually distributed laptops to uh, not laptops but tablets to students those who who wanted it uh and then uh, what type of questions i needed to ask that i had to decide i had all sorts of questions including uh, multiple choice to free response uh free response were manually graded because i wanted them to have those free response type of questions so that i can ask them uh, multiple things in one question so just to assess their uh comprehensive understanding then i had to create some question banks which took a lot of time 
so that uh, no students get same questions. Uh, so that that is another deterrent that if they know that uh, you are going to get different questions, then there is no point in cheating or asking anybody else. Then I gave them practice exam just so that they feel comfortable with the tool that they are using. And then, of course, I had to keep in mind students were in different time zones. They were homes. Um, so I had to keep my exam open accordingly. So I gave them two days typically to take the exam. And then, of course, I had to take, keep in mind the students with disabilities. And of course, my the important lesson that I learned is about taking students into confidence and giving them clear instructions on what happens. Uh, so, for example, if for some reason, if I get, uh, if I'm monitoring, I'm using monitor and uh, if I know that some students is cheating or kind of constantly uh, doing uh, something else because he is not in the frame of video camera, then I told them that they will be, uh, they will have to, uh, I will contact them and then uh, I will give them an oral exam because I wanted to make sure that they, uh, their uh, knowledge is being assessed or their learning outcomes uh, is being assessed. So that is all I have for today. And then in summary, a uh, few things to know that you have to know your students who they are. We have to know our course material, what we are covering. And then we have to remember that we are testing the course outcomes and not giving exam just for the sake of giving exams. And then low stake multiple exams. This is the important lesson I learned that instead of giving one or two high stake exams, a low stake multiple exams or quizzes or homeworks, students prefer that. That is spread out through, throughout the semester. But then still I have to have one comprehensive exam at the end of the semester. Uh, so that is it. Uh, and then I will hand over to Brina for the next. Thank you. Our uh, next panelist is Bill Kitch, and he will be discussing uh, laboratory activities in an online environment. Okay, I hope you're seeing my slides. I can't tell what you're seeing. Um, so I'm talking about labs. I was asked to talk about labs. I'd like to thank uh, everybody for this opportunity to do this. I've got a lot of links and stuff in here, and I just uh, heard that we maybe not have an excellent way to share slides with you right away. If you want these slides, please email me, and if you put Ready, Set, Remote in the, in the title of it, it'll help me sort those out. Um, what I'm, I'm quickly going to talk about different kinds of online labs. There's, there's different classifications on them. I'll show you some resources for you to do online geotechnical labs. And then finally, I'm going to briefly talk to you about the tools I use to build online content. Um, I like this. Uh, when we talk about labs, there are basically three categories of labs. Uh, when we talk about remote or I'm sorry, talk about online or, or web enabled apps. The first ones, these are the three remote labs, simulations and video recorded. And I'll talk about those individual. Remote labs are labs where students actually access real laboratory equipment online, but it's re uh, they, they, they access real laboratory equipment, but they just do it remotely over the web. And then the students are actually controlling the entire operation of the lab and doing all the data collection. Obviously, this requires digital control of both the, the laboratory equipment plus the, the data collection systems. Uh, these have been used mostly for non-destructive kind of labs, like things like circuits, electronics, wind tunnels, pumps, things where you don't have to put specimens in them. Um, there's been significant work and research of these uh, from the mid 90s through 2015. Um, one of the big deals with these is the long-term maintenance and operations are a big limitation of these. A lot of these were kicked off with grants and since the grants run out, uh, they're not well maintained because <clears throat> of, they didn't plan for sustainability of them. Um, this is an example of my uh, soil mechanics lab and, and uh, something that could be turned into a remote lab. If you think about it, this is my consolidation setup. It's all digital right now, uh, but I don't have the, uh, an interface that allows students to actually come in and do that. So um, maybe I can talk Troutwine in to help me do that. Uh, if anybody's interested in, in collaborating on that, let me know. Um, simulations is another uh, way to do remote lab or uh, online labs. 
And these were you're actually doing digital simulations of the physical experiments. In geotech, those are usually triaxial tests, consolidation, hydraulic connectivity, the ones that have been done. Again, a bunch of these have been developed over the years. Um, I've listed some of the universities there that did it. As far as I know, the only one is, of these that's still up and running is the Geosim one. And even that one this last weekend, I tried to download it and run it, and it crashed a bunch of times on me. The issue with these, again, is a maintenance issue. A lot of these are developed by one person or two or three people, and when that person is gone, or retired, they don't update and maintain it for the new uh, <clears throat> the new computer systems, and so these tend to have uh, problems with longevity because they're not planning for maintenance. So that leaves us with what I think most of us have been doing for the last uh, several months, which is video capture with data. It's a pretty straightforward process conceptually. You know, you, you or your grad student or lab tech or somebody performs the tests and films it, and then you provide the students with the data to analyze. I do see some people using video capture with these or the instruments and have students actually read the instruments. Uh, that's kind of tedious, and I don't find that particularly useful. Um, so I'm just going to talk about resources for doing this video capture stuff. Um, right after the pandemic came out, I started a group on my geo world uh, called GLSI, uh, Geotech Lab Instruction Share. Um, that if you go there, you'll find a catalog of who has laboratory resources in terms of video and data that, are, that you can uh, get and use. Um, and again, I'm, I will make sure you get these links if you email me or if we find a place to deposit these slides. Um, there's tons and tons of video on YouTube, but the issue is you need curated ones. So these are five sites that I've been on that I think have uh, good uh, resources. There are other ones, I'm sure, out there. These are just the ones I know about. Uh, I'm obviously, uh, the first one is mine. I've actually been doing this for almost 20, uh, over 10 years right now. Some of my early videos are almost 20 years old. Um, and I will tell you that I highly recommend that you put stuff online, make it public. I, um, I did this by accident first, and it's and getting things on public and getting feedback has only made my stuff better. I just checked before we started the program. I got like almost 900,000 views on my stuff, and the last month I had 13,000 views of stuff. Um, and that just tells you that there's a lot of people out here that will look at and use your data. Um, when you look at these videos that are online, there's basically three kinds of them. There's ones that are basically your theory presentations or the things you'd be doing in a lecture before class that aren't aren't really directly about the lab, but they're about the theory behind it. Uh, that I think you're most you're you're used to using that stuff. The stuff that uh, when you look at stuff that's actually lab oriented, there's two kinds. There's ones that are sort of like pre lab preparation stuff. These usually recap the theory or they overview the lab procedure, but they don't really necessarily go step by step through the labs. And then there's ones that are actual lab execution. They're step by step procedures with specimen preparation and all the data collection and stuff. And so when you're looking at those, you need to kind of figure out which one you kind of you're looking at and know which one you're looking for. Are you just looking for an overview? review a lab or you're looking for a step site step procedure where the students can actually follow each step of the lab. Um, there's some other good resources out there in geoengineering.org. There's a, I have a, a, a um, share alike lab manual there if you want to take that. You can completely repurpose it if you want. Take what you like and then throw away what you don't want. And then Usugar also has a bunch of links out there under resources and teaching aids. Um, so that's a quick overview of lab materials that are online. Um, here's the tools that I use to develop my stuff. I honestly, when I do video recordings, I've gotten to use my iPhone more than video cameras. I used to use video cameras a lot. And now I just use my iPhone probably 80% of the time. I highly recommend getting an external lapel mic for it. If you're going to do that, they don't cost much and they, your audio will be much, much better. For graphics and simple animations, I use PowerPoint. I've got a link here to one of my more animated PowerPoints. If you want to see what you can do in that, that's the actual my CPT uh, um, video that shows uh, the ongoing what happens when you actually do a CPT test. There's a really if you like doing handwriting and whiteboard stuff and you like to write equations by hand, I highly recommend you looking for Doseri. It's a if you want to think of Word as a word processing tool, Doseri is like a pen stroke processing tool where you can edit and change your pen strokes and then play them back. And so it's great for doing uh, more vernacular um, presentations than well crafted perfect uh, typeset equations kind of stuff. Um, and I've got a YouTube I got a link there to a YouTube video where I use a lot of that data. Uh, for the video editing, I like Camtasia. It's uh, you know, reasonably priced and has lots and lots of tools that you can do all kinds of stuff with Camtasia that you can't do with other things, but it's not like a full professional thing that costs thousands of dollars. 
And so those are the, those are the tools I use. Um, so in summary, you know, remote or simulated labs seem to be dying uh, after one generation because they don't have the maintenance till. Although I tell you, the commercial providers uh, like Tech Equipment just came out with a system that they're trying to market. So maybe if the if the actual uh, paid providers uh, take these things on, we'll actually have some remote labs that you can use. We're, I think we're stuck with the video labs with pre-recorded stuff for right now. There's a bunch of stuff online. The real issue is curating them for your course and your applications. Um, the video creation tools we have are actually inexpensive. Time is the big cost. And I like to, I think this is probably the fifth or sixth time you've heard this, but the, 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 you need to think of this stuff as an investment in the future for your future selves. I've got stuff out there that I prepared uh, 12 years ago and I'm still using it. It's great. Um, and I would also like to reiterate that being more, the more vernacular is the better. Uh, my first stuff was all well produced and very carefully narrated. And I find that just being my true self uh, is much more appealing to students. I hope that's valuable. I know that was quick and I realized nobody copied the links. Um, if we don't find a place to deposit these easily and quickly, just email me and I'll be happy to share all this with you. Now I got to figure out how to quit sharing my screen. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Bill. I'll jump in real quick to say that we are planning on posting these resources on the Soil Properties and Modeling Committee webpage um, after the event today, and I'll make sure that that link gets disseminated through Sugar as well. Um, also, the YouTube Live is going to be here forever, too, for you to, to go back and visit in the future. Our last panelist today is Carrie Douglas, a professor in engineering education at Purdue University uh, with a research focus on online learning. And we're honored that she's here today and help us um, learn um, and share student perspectives for online learning. Great, thank you. And thank you for having me. We've had a lot of really great information. If you're like me, I've been taking notes and um, this has all been really helpful. So I know it's a lot of information, kind of like drinking from a fire hose. So I'm going to try to get through um, some practical things here for you and um, hopefully it'll be useful. So um, as things were going down in the spring, I've been talking with my colleague at Ohio State, Julie Martin, and we started thinking about how um, students were being supported and um, we were able to get an NSF rapid grant to uh, fund some research on instructor choices and student support and um, online courses during COVID. So the first thing I'm going to share with you real quick is that this is just a sample of the questions that we asked, but really in all of the areas, um, students reported a decrease in resources during the pandemic from before the pandemic. So you can see here in our chart, um, that you know they reported decreases and having someone to talk to about um, help with content or helping with an assignment or someone who was recommending uh, courses, et cetera. So this was pretty um, consistent across uh, the questions that we were asking specifically related to how students were getting resources or support. Um, and then we also have been doing interviews. And so this is all part of a bigger project, the RAPID Award, that would be to um, understand, like looking at courses and classes specifically. So um, we have some quotes here from our interviews and the open-ended questions. Um, the main things from this is that the students are really talking about their peer relationships as being important for learning. And so, for example, one student said, much of what I learned was from my peers. And so you think about when the students were in person in class, if they didn't get something, they could just turn to the person beside them and say, hey, did you understand that? And they could help each other out or maybe walking to and from class together. Uh, there are all these ways that they were able to interact with each other about the content and the course, but in an online way, they may not even have any of each other's contact information. So this, uh, many of the students said things like, after moving to remote learning, I felt like I was pretty much on my own. Another key point here is um, that the students, many of the students reported that motivation and focus were a struggle. So one student said, uh, staying focused and getting my work done um, has been very challenging or motivation to learn and participate is infinitely more difficult when four-sixths of my 
classes went to asynchronous learning. Another student said, I've definitely become a lazier student because of it. So we see that all this time and when they have what appears to be very unstructured time where they, it, it seems like they have a ton of time. It was very hard for them to stay motivated and disciplined uh, to stay on top of their studies. So another aspect that came up was that the students really do need feedback and they need it timely. Um, so a lot of the questions were speaking to this, that um, the question's not answered as quickly. They said, um, you know, I never got a personal interaction. It was simply going between recorded lecture and homework or to the homework. Um, the asking questions was challenging things like, you know, I didn't understand their explanation and I felt weird asking them twice. And so just the awkwardness of posing questions in a written format and what do you do when you still don't understand um, asking those follow-up questions was rough. Um, so now I'm going to move on to some uh, recommendations based on this. And I think some of these are going to be similar to what the pr previous presenters had hit on. But the first is uh, to be a real person. And to don't, not just assume that everyone is doing okay. And when we're real, we can acknowledge that the there is a toll that the pandemic is having on students and they are experiencing losses. So even if they haven't, I mean, there's a chance that they've gotten sick or someone in their family's gotten sick or there might be financial difficulties in their household or maybe they've had to look for a part-time job. And even if they aren't experiencing uh, those kind of problems, they're still having uh, significant loss. You know, students spend most of the, uh, you know, they've been looking forward to college for many years and um, not being all together on campus or not being able to do all their social functions. It's very different. And that is disappointing, I think, for a lot of them. Um, another thing is to reach out directly to individual students or group of students. And along with this is to address students by their name and communication. So there's a lot of, there's been research that um, students who report an instructor actually knows their name are more likely to have um, better retention. And I think this really matters also as we're in this COVID time or online time because um, where they don't know us, they aren't getting that interaction, it is important for them to know that somebody out there cares about them. And along with that is to be flexible. And again, understanding that we're all working through things right now. Um, Nobody has this all figured out. Uh, the second point is to be available. So some things you might do, um, have regularly established times where the students can talk to you. So you set the time and then you're just there available. Another is to start your link for court the class early and then hang around and leave a little bit late. And I find students will sometimes ask questions that are totally relevant for everyone else in that time. And then I can actually respond back um, in that immediate spot. Another is to set expectations on how you want them to ask questions and the time frame to expect them that they can expect for feedback. So for example, if you have a learning management system, you have a course social media discussion, um, maybe you also have some, you know, a Piazza or Yelljig or so, there's all different apps and tools that can be used so do you want them to email you? I mean, how do you want them to pose questions and respond back? And so I know um, by having one spot for that, that can really save your email or you can put, you say, okay, on, you know, this time I'm going to be answering all questions. It'll help you get organized too. And then some of the others have mentioned this, but identify what resources communicate the content already. So there are a lot of things on YouTube, textbooks, recorded lectures. And so utilizing those so that you can focus your time more on the interaction side and the feedback side. Um, and with this is that really the majority of the teaching time should be spent on interacting with the students or providing them feedback. Uh, and so all the resources that you are creating that you can hold on to um, will benefit you in the future. And then that enables you to be more present with the students. Another recommendation is to facilitate peer interactions and um, accountability. And so again, you want to foster this we're in it together type of attitude. And so some ways you might do this is to group students together into learning groups um, for the entire semester. And so facilitate them like say, I want you to share your contact information with the others in the group and 
set up co-working times where they know that they are all right there working on their assignments together. Um, and obviously, you know, you can have conversations about the difference between collaboration and cheating, but getting them to where they're actually able to ask each other questions and that will save you time as well. Um, another is to try a hybrid approach that works for you. So we hear a lot about, oh, do synchronous or a are you doing asynchronous? And I think everyone has to sort of figure out how that's going to work best with their teaching style. And I think that um, having a combination is really a, can be really effective. And so what's best done synchronous, what's best done asynchronous, I think interactions are best in real time. And you're able to answer questions, provide feedback, where when you're disseminating content, that can be done, you know, on separate time. And so the value of really being all together at the same time is that interaction. You might try breakout rooms. I think um, one of the other speakers mentioned um, having a Zoom room with breakout rooms and TAs in different rooms. I think that's awesome. We did something very similar. Um, and you can come up with an alternate assignment for the students who aren't able to physically or synchronously be there. Um, back to what I said, you know, use your content expertise when it matters the most, which is, again, in that interaction with the students where you're there helping them understand. And so utilizing your resources. Another thing that's been hit on pre a little bit, but I'm going to say it more directly, is to establish that structure and communicate weekly course routine. So post a weekly schedule of activities and to-do lists. So by you creating this routine, it's going to help the students stay on top of things. When there's a lot of moving parts for every course, it's very difficult for the students to keep track of everything going on. But if they know, well, every Tuesday I do this and I have to have my assignment done by Thursday so that I'm ready for class, you know, that sort of thing, um, it's a lot easier for them to stay on top of. And then another, as another speaker mentioned, but having those milestones for the long-term projects where you're able to provide feedback and then they can iterate. So that's what I have for this. Um, thank you for sticking around. Uh, and yes, so I'll hand it over. Great, thank you. So at this point, we're going to transition into our question and answer session. Um, I know we've had a couple come in, um, and there are also a few questions from our uh, survey as well. So I am going to hand it over to Matt and Michelle to, ask, to start asking the panelists questions. Thanks, Brina. So we're going to start one uh, from the survey, and then um, we will go to kind of back and forth uh, from chat to survey and some things that kind of came up. Uh, through not only these presentations, but also through the responses. So the first, I'm going to actually pose this to Carrie, and then if there are other panelists that want to add in um, on the back end, please feel free to. So several survey respondents noticed that the talented students often actually became disengaged from the class when it transitioned to the virtual environment. Um, so I guess it's two part. Number one, how can we prevent that from happening? And then is there anything we can do once we notice students have disengaged and that will help pull them back? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think, engage, again, engaging with the students in the ways that we've been talking about is important in fostering that idea that we're in it together and providing that accountability. I think when we, so when we set up, basically there was a, a Google Doc and different people could sign up to work together, co-working times. And then it's sort of, I got a lot of, so this is anecdotal, this isn't from the research, but I got a lot of feedback that it really kept them going, you know, and that knowing that someone else was there and working on this, you know, facilitated, but it's disappointing for them. And I think taking the time to acknowledge, hey, this isn't the way you want it to be. This isn't the way that I want it to be, um, but we're in it together and sort of, caring each other type of attitude. That's what I would, how I think about it. Okay. Excuse me. We've got a, an audience question uh, where someone's asked, has anyone discovered any new opportunities since everything's re moved remote? Um, for example, uh, maybe now it's easier to invite guest speakers to come to your class or are there other barriers that, uh, that are no longer there when you're now online? 
So this is Bill Kitch. I'll, I'll quickly say that inviting new people is actually one of the things that has gotten better. We're planning, to, for instance, this fall to host a geotech slash uh, geology uh, webinar thing where we're, we're inviting professionals in both geology and geotech to talk about how they work together and to, and to excite students about the fields. And so that's something that we wouldn't have done. Uh, you know, I'm in remote West Texas. I can't get these people to come to San Angelo. So that is uh, one advantage um, that, that's happened. I'll echo that as well. Um, I know for my campus, they've uh, obtained campus licenses for things like Camtasia and some of these other tools. They used to be, you know, $250 a license, but there are now campus licenses popping up all over the place. So it's worth reaching out to whoever does the uh, teaching and learning center on your campus of what resources have been purchased for faculty on campus to use that there was no need for a campus license before. And actually um, things like this are a big advantage. I want to say, you know, uh, I've got a lot more collaboration with, I, I, there's way more people doing online geotech stuff than I realized were doing it. And I just never bothered to talk to him before we started getting together, say, hey, hey, how can we do this? I think creating breakout rooms and Zoom and other platforms where you can get students that otherwise wouldn't be interacting with each other and together without taking all the time in class to get them reworked, I think is a benefit. And then um, the instructor can pop in and out of each of the groups. You know, I think some of that affords a little bit more for different kinds of interaction. Hi, this is Katarina. Um, to, to build on that, yes, the breakout rooms are uh, very beneficial. The other thing that I found um, easy to do was in office hours to just press the recording button whenever a student would ask a good question that would lead me to solving a problem like off the bat, um, I would just press a record button and I would say, oh yeah, that would be really cool to share. And then you just post that and then students get more exposure and actually the office hours. And we heard that with my colleagues, both at the graduate level and the undergraduate level, it was more efficient for students to just log into a Zoom room than go home, come back to campus um, and things like that. And um, whenever they wanted to interact with each other, I was like, oh, I'm going to put you in another breakout room while you guys wait and you, you can work together. So um, even that is, is a newfound benefit. I'll add one more quick benefit that I found because I had to change my grading structure for my class. I put a lot more emphasis on writing and their lab reports. And by the end of the semester, the undergraduates in soil mechanics were so much better at writing than, than we tr traditionally hold them accountable for because I have more weights on exams um, and other things. And that was a way that, um, you know, I don't have to worry about cheating because they're individual lab reports. And everyone is now a senior in at K-State and knows that data is a plural word because I obsessed about it for an entire semester. And I'm so <laughs> proud. Okay, we have another question that kind of comes from the survey, and I'm going to kind of combine a couple of, of thoughts or concepts. You just talked and mentioned kind of a few of these, but if you had to think about some of the activities that you've done in the past, but also maybe new activities or things that you changed during this pandemic kind of teaching, um, which ones do you think captured the level of student mastery? mastery? Um, more currently than maybe they had in the past, or how did that actually compare? Was, you know, were the quizzes comparable to previous semesters? Did you kind of adjust and you had new ways of um, looking at assessment and, you know, just kind of the, the way in which you felt comfortable that they had learned something when it was all said and done? Um, this is Bill Kitch again. I'll, I'll take that and combine, I, I know there was a question about cheating on exams. And um, so I think the way, and we had, a, I'm a chair, so I, we had one huge cheating issue with the statics course where, you know, in retrospect, we looked at it and all we did was set students up to cheat on it, you know, and, and we realized, well, this was stupid. Why did we do this? Um, and so I think uh, my point about the exams is you just need to completely rethink about how to do them. So you can't do the same kind of thing. And then, and, and what I did with that, uh, I, 
used fewer exams or less value on the exams. But And I do lots of concept questions in my exams. And I basically gave them all kinds of time to do it. I didn't use lockdown browser and those things because my stu- I had a real issue with technology with my students. Most of them didn't have the, the technology they needed to do that. And I gave them like... I don't know, 18 hours to take the exam, and, and, and I broke it into a bunch of different pieces. Um, and I expect it, you know, I said, this is open book, this is open anything but another person. And, you know, I think they actually then did, they, they took the time to actually go, you know, sort of like remaster the, the, the material there, and, and they did actually did better. Now, were they cheating and collaborating with each other? That's, that's possible, I, but the way the exams are written, it, it was, you know, less likely. So I, I actually, I think by rethinking the assessment, let me just call them assessments. And I think Brent had a great, you know, his presentation was really good on that. I think what it made me do is rethink the assessment methods and we give people more time. And, and by nature, we had to give people more time to do things, more wall clock time, I mean. And, you know, the students that are better, uh, you know, with more time to think about stuff, you know, showed up. And so I think one of the good things that came out of this was rethinking assessments I, um, and, you know, whether it's spending more time on writing or other things, I think, you know, these, it d- forced us to not value our exams as much, which I think if we do it correctly, actually leads to better assessment of learning and, and outcomes of students. Yeah, this is Carrie. If I can hop in right on that. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying. And you know, I think there is a mistake of thinking that, you know, whatever we did in person, we can just automatically post online. And it just, I think it really, the move to online really forces us to stop and think for, think like, okay, what is it that we really want the students to take away from this course, you know, a year from now, or, you know, and how are they going to use this information? So I think a lot about, you know, how would a student demonstrate this knowledge in their engineering practice? you know, or how are they going to demonstrate this knowledge? Because if, you know, if they can Google it or they can look it up, I I like to think like, if they can Google it, why am I asking it? You know, but if they spend all their time Googling, then they're going to be really slow at their job, right? I mean, they're not going to be very efficient. And so what's like, what is it that I'm expecting them to really be able to do? And how do I know they can do that? And so can I pose some authentic questions you know, to them that they're going to have to solve. Um, and one one of the things I think I want to mention that hasn't been touched on or hasn't been mentioned with assessments is um, creating variance in the exams. And so, um, so the way this can be done is by identifying, like, here's the learning objectives that we're going to hit on for this exam or this assessment, and then coming up with, you know, two to three different questions on for each learning objective. My grad student um, programmed into MATLAB, essentially a random generator for each, then for each student in the course. And so it wasn't like we had two forms of the exams. It was um, that they, each student had a unique exam. Um, just to quickly add before we move um, into more questions um, to add on Bill um, and Carrie. So one of the things that is important is exactly as, as some people said, you know, some pe- some things are going to go and it's about convincing yourself that it's okay. It's okay because students can teach themselves later or because these things are going to be organic in some class downstream. So in that regard, um, one thing that I, I, I found useful from our end and depends, of course, on the curriculum is to coordinate with professors who teach downstream classes. For example, I teach soil mechanics. Ross Boulanger teaches foundations. Jason DeYoung teaches geotech earthquake engineering for undergrad. So it is important to have a conversation and say, what will you guys absolutely need? Okay. And, and assessments can be anything. So for example, and that's, that, that comes into, into freeing your mind a little bit. Uh, one of the assessments I did was like, watch me draw a more circle for a direct shear test tracking the rotation of principal stresses and submit it back to me. So they w- I just wanted them to see me do something and have them do it back. And for some people, that is also usable knowledge. So it's, it's just about keeping it simple and just getting them to learn the, the, the things are absolutely useful. Great, thank you. Um, the next audience question is, um, 
are, are people doing at home geotech labs or what about uh, field trips, maybe virtual field trips, anything like that? Um, this is Bill Kitch again. I have done the at-home labs, and I'm not teaching my soil mechanics class this semester, but I'll be teaching it in the fall. And I'm planning on and having the students for things like understanding plasticity and and some of those uh, more fundamental principles uh, to do um, at-home labs. You can actually do an at-home compaction lab where they at least un they at least get the understanding of the relationship between compaction water content and soil stiffness. You might not actually be able to measure. Uh, density, but you can measure uh, other soil properties indirectly. And so, yeah, there are a bunch of those that you can do. Um, uh, you know, they ain't going to be ASTM standard labs, but that's really, you know, for most of us, that's not what we're teaching them to be technicians. We're trying to get them to understand the behavior. And yeah, there are some to, that you can do there. And I think, and on the qualitative side, there's lots of cool stuff you can do. I do um, side group one. Yeah, this is Brettling. Well, I do uh, virtual field trips using a lot of the uh, the case histories that have been compiled by Gear. Uh, a lot of the 3D ortho models. You can uh, go to some of the sites. Some of the investigators have hosted, and you can fly around embankment failures and slope failures and different things, and use those as virtual field trips. You can go to Alaska. You can go to Indonesia all in one sitting. Perfect, thank you. Um, this one I may pose to Katarina, but then others, if you have input, that would be wonderful. I know you did a type of kind of Zoom open house chat room type thing. What are some ways, maybe icebreakers or some other nice ways to get students to participate and encourage them to actually come? Do you require them to, to show up for office hours if you do kind of a Zoom or a virtual office hours? I had grad students and I would have maybe one pop in every once in a while, but a lot of times I felt like, you know, I was just kind of sitting there in my virtual office hours alone. So are there ways that we can encourage that and not just make it mandatory, but things that make them want to participate? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I specifically thought about how to encourage them. I, I, I just chose to be very annoying from the beginning. Hey guys, I'm going to be on Zoom. Join me again. Hey guys, I'm going to be on Zoom. Just one hour. Join me. And then with, with getting that video out and realizing that, you know, that I'm a normal human being and I just want to have fun with this class, um, they started showing up. And then um, one other thing I did was in the beginning of the lectures, they would start at 2 10 p.m. Uh, on Thursdays. I would join at 2 and I would put songs, contemporary songs, or songs that they would put in the chat just so that we could just, you know, be, be, be normal and human. And then some of them started gradually joining earlier and chatting to me or joining office hours. And then they, they, would, they would feel it more. I think that had to do more with channeling my personality and, and then getting the TAs to chat with me. Um, and just, you know, getting them to come in. The other thing I did at the end, and, and one thing that was another complexity of the quarter was that it went past the Memorial Day and um, the killing of George Floyd. So that started affecting the students a lot during weeks eight, nine, and 10. So what I did is that um, I did a Calendly invite for 10 minute one-on-one -on -one chats with the students. Because I basically said, you guys are gonna have questions about your grades, the finals, the situation of the world right now. So sign up for a 10 minute one by one with me. And I think like 50% of them took that opportunity. Um, and some of them had specific questions about their grades or needed calculations. And others were, you know what? I just wanted to chat with you. Thank you, I'm not worried piece out, you know? So it, it was just continuously building and showing, you know, availability. And then they, they will just join. I think it, it becomes organic. This is Lalita. Can I just start adding? Sure. Uh, I, I actually just paint half an hour after every lecture, uh, just in the same Zoom room. If anybody had any questions or if they want to talk to each other, uh, or if they want to ask me any questions, uh, they could, it was up to them. So I found that it, it really worked well because students wanted to talk to each other. So I would put them in Zoom breakout rooms and then they would talk to each other. Uh, or if they want to talk to me, 
uh, in person, then I would, they would say that in the chat room that I want to talk to you in person, then I would just, uh, I would tell them that I will be available after that. So I left about half an hour in addition yeah. to my class just to chat to students because they needed that support. Um, so that's what I did. I'll just add one more quick thing. I gave them um, options. So my uh, all my lectures were asynchronous. So I used our class time as an office hour time. Um, and so I had the Zoom room open, but I also had uh, the chat open in Canvas because some of them were more comfortable going to the chat and then they could see the stream there and it was available for later. Some of them used the discussion and then a lot of them used Zoom um, and some of them called me too. And so I really let the students, I just said, hey, I'm going to be available from 1230 to 120 like I always have been. That's when I'm usually in class. It's conveniently during lunchtime. So I had lunch with a lot of students. You know, they'd say, where are you? And I'd say, oh, sorry, I went to make a sandwich and come back. And so those kind of informal fun things, I think, also were what um, encouraged them to use it. I find that we have trained our students to be non-participants. Uh, culturally, they go through their entire academic careers from kindergarten through whenever they come to our geotechnical classes in upper division. And they, they're, they're highly trained in sitting. Um, some of them are competent in note taking, but they're all trained in sitting. So I spend uh, a couple of lectures early in the semester and train them to participate. We have I have a set of activities that I've gleaned from some of the engagement literature and also from experts in engagement who have free YouTube videos on how to engage people in like parties and things. And I train them. They don't realize they're being trained, but the first few class sessions, they're being trained on engaging so that by the end of the semester, the students are initiating the conversations. They're initiating things so I don't have to. And so we can sit back and we can have this great conversation of 30 people participating and the students want to come. Generally, there's a few holdouts, but generally they want to come because they're having a good experience. Thank you. I think I'm going to need to cut it off there. I know that we didn't get to all of the audience questions, and I apologize for that. I'd like to thank the panelists for joining us here today and for your time and sharing your experiences with us here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the resources will be available on our um, GI Soil Properties and Modeling Committee website. I'll make sure that gets sent out through USugar um, and possibly even posted in the um, comments on the uh, YouTube, live as, uh, YouTube Live as well. Uh, there's other uh, uh, resources I'd like to draw to your attention. ASCE Exceed Community Exchange is offering free web webinars to all ASCE members that are on related topics. Geostrata will also have an article in their November-December issues on resources to enhance the geotechnical educational experience. And then also our this committee, our Soil Properties and Modeling Committee, is uh, going to be hosting a session at the upcoming Geo Congress on this topic as well. So thanks again to the GI. If you have questions about the GI, please click the link in the um, website um, below the video. And thank you all for um, coming here and joining us today. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for coming, everybody.